Welcome to Short Talks from the Hill, a podcast from the University of Arkansas. I'm Harn Young, and I'm a writer here at the university. Today, I'd like to welcome Kartik Balashandran, an associate professor of biomedical engineering. Balashandran's research focuses on the development of microphysiological systems, also known as organs on chips. Balashandran has been with the university since 2012, and he's busy working on several grants, including three from the Department of Defense, two from the National Institute of Health, and one from the National Science Foundation. Kartik Balashandran, welcome to Short Talks. Thank you for having me. So let's just start with the basics. What are organs on chips and what makes them useful for research? Right, so organ on chip systems are basically what I would call an upgrade from your regular two-dimensional cell culture systems that are quite commonly used uh, all across biomedical research. And what it does is it tries to recapitulate the three-dimensionality, the different cell types, all the different matrix proteins and other components that exist in organs to try and create a more complex uh, model that one can use on the laboratory bench. And so this would in, you know, include things like having multiple cell types uh, interacting and talking to uh, each other in a, um, an experimental model, incorporation of things like blood flow uh, or mechanical stimulation if that organ in question is you know, dynamically moving like the heart. So why are you guys using this as a research model? Yeah, so I think um, the main motivation for using these kinds of models um, is that it is a much better mimic of what goes on inside the body. You know, short of using animal models um, or you know, other um, sort of living models, organ on chip systems in- include and incorporate um, multiple different things that make an organ system more dynamic uh, and, and it makes it more realistic. And so it's for those reasons that, you know, we li- that, at least in my research lab, we like to use these organ on chip systems because we think it's a better mimic of what happens inside the body. Secondly, Uh, we can engineer these organ on chip systems using human cells. And so that already gives it a, you know, we can consider an upgrade from small animal like mice or rabbit models. And so uh, for these two reasons, I think, you know, organ on chip systems are advantageous in the laboratory compared to other models that are out there. So not only does it mimic human biology, but it also eliminates, you could say it's more humane, it eliminates animal testing. That is true. That is correct. Okay. And uh, how did you get into this? That's a good question. So You know, I did my PhD uh, in Georgia Tech, and we were using mostly animal-based cell and tissue models. And then when I went on to my postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard University, and that's where I got introduced to this field of uh, organ on chip systems. And there was, you know, a group there that was working on a um, lung on chip system. And uh, I came in there with the view of creating a heart valve on chip type of system. And so what I you know, saw very quickly was the um, advantages of you know, these organ on chip type of systems, like I was mentioning just before, and the possibility of you know, learning some of the skills that these other research groups were using in trying to build these three, three-dimensional systems to incorporate different cell types, blood flow, and so on and so forth. Also in that ecosystem um, in and around Harvard, uh, we had the opportunity to talk with you know, folks from the pharma industry, with folks, folks from you know, other research groups. And I did see that there was a keen interest in these types of organ chip models, how they could become more applicable for drug testing, understanding disease mechanisms. And so all these um, various factors motivate me to really dive into this line of research um, you know, once I came here um, to the University of Arkansas. Okay, so let me ask you this. What, uh, what organs are you specifically focusing on in your lab? We have, we're mostly, you know, trying to understand the organs which are dynamically moving around um, because that, you know, my background is in mechanical engineering and I'm always interested in what the intersection of, you know, mechanical motion and forces are with disease. And so keeping that in mind, we're looking at organs in the cardiovascular system, specifically the heart, the heart valve. And so we have a heart on chip and a heart valve on chip that I have uh, one student each working on those systems. Another system that we're working on is the blood-brain barrier. And so we have a blood-brain barrier that is the interface between the blood and the brain. And then we've developed a blood-brain barrier on chip to look at the effects of traumatic brain injury and how that might affect the uh, blood-brain barrier short and long term. Most recently, we've started working on a nasal airway on chip model. And that is a, um, a project where we're looking at the effects of particulate matter pollution and how that might affect um, nasal epithelia and any downstream uh, effects that that might have on the nasal biology. Okay, so uh, let's just take an example. Of, we'll use the blood-brain barrier chip. 
how do you build a working model of the blood-brain burial? What, what, are, what are some of the broad steps you would take? So that's a great question. So we always start with um, you know, what's already available in nature. So that is the actual uh, blood-brain barrier. And we typically begin first with a very deep dive into how the blood-brain barrier is, you know, I'm gonna use the word engineered, but how it's made from a perspective of, you know, what are the cell types? How are the cell types arranged? Very important uh, question is what are the length scales involved? You know, how far apart are the cells from each other or how close are they to each other? Are there any barriers? And how thick are the barriers between these various cell types? So once we have a, and you know, all this can be obtained, you know, from either from our clinical partners or histological, uh, histopathological um, collaborators that we work with. And then once we get that information, then we ask ourselves in our research group, how can we boil that down to a simple model that is feasible for engineering in the laboratory, but at the same time incorporating some of the very different complexities that exist that can give us some useful information. And so based on that, we narrow it down to you know two or more cell types, a couple of different proteins that make up the overall matrix that these cells are um, growing in. Uh, we know the blood-brain barrier involves blood flow, and so we, ha we have to analyze you know, what are the flow rates, uh, what are the shear stresses, um, how big are the blood vessels in the blood-brain barrier, and you know, can we build um, those kinds of structures in the lab. And so once we have a good understanding of you know, the so-called technical requirements, we can then translate that into things that we can actually build on the bench. Once we've built it, then of course it's an iterative validation step. So we examine its performance based on different engineering biological markers, and then we see whether that mimics the actual real blood-brain barrier. And then you know, if it doesn't, you know, we do a version two and so on and so forth until we feel we have achieved something that you know, reasonably mimics what's seen in the body. And what kind of timeline does that typically take you to get like a solid working model? So you know, it's a, that's a that's a good question. You know, as researchers, we're always trying to get the perfect model, right? But sometimes, you know, we have to accept that you can't get that 100% perfect model. And so, typically, this process would be, you know, would take a couple of uh, versions versions of iteration, and um, you know, may take anywhere from you know six months to one and a half, two years to get a model that's working. And then once we have a working model, you know, while we're using that model to ask questions, ask research questions, the iterations don't stop. So we keep you know, trying to improve on it. At some point in the future, you know, we can get a version two or a version three that is you know, working better. And so all these things are working in parallel all the time. But to answer your first question, you know, it typically takes six months to six to 24 months. So that's to get a working model, and then you can get increasingly more specific in what you study after that. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So we can study the effect of you know, the communication between the different cell types, the effects of you know, traumatic brain injury. Uh, we can model transport of uh, molecules across the blood-brain barrier before and after injury. So we can do a wide variety of things with these models. Yeah, and I think that's probably setting up my next question, which is you're, you've got a couple of grants with the blood-brain barrier, one of which is to study traumatic brain injuries, but the, uh, there's another one that's got a commercial aspect. Can you talk a little bit about how this technology might be commercialized for broader use? Right, exactly. So we have a couple of uh, um, SBIR and SDTR grants together with um, a local startup here, Nanometronics, with the ultimate end user being the Department of Defense and the Air Force. And what they are interested in is you being able to use this as a model to test you know, various kind of military relevant insults that might happen to, uh, in the case of the Air Force pilots or soldiers, in the case of the, uh, the Army, following traumatic brain injury. And so what we're doing is we're trying to um, create this model to be of relevance to them by using human cells, uh, being able to inject any sort of chemical insults, and also using traumatic brain injuries that are of relevance to these different target populations. So essentially, it's not very different from a research-oriented project, but just some of these um, stimuli that we're looking at that we can impose on the blood-brain barrier chip model is slightly more relevant to the military context. So you'd have like a base model that they, they can adapt to their special needs. Exactly. So the idea here is we can build a model and that we can ship off to them, and then they can either put their cells of interest um, and you know, do whatever experiments they want, or we would have the cells and we would do the testing for them, and then you know, we would ship it off and they would do their biological analysis. And that's sort of the broad commercialization aspect of, of this whole thing. So one last question, and it's something we were kind of talking about offline. You said that you think that you're, you're really seeing this field accelerating. Could you kind of chart out where you think it's 
where it's going, or even if you want to be more specific about what's going to happen here on campus in your in your department. Okay, yeah. So I think you know, like I said, mentioned, this field is really expanding. It's an exciting time to be in this particular field, and in terms of where I think this field might be going, it really is. Um, you know, A, to use more human relevant cells in these various models, whether it be the lung, the kidney, the liver, and so on and so forth. And so what is really helping that is the um, increased prevalence of what are called induced pluripotent stem cells. And so these are stem cells that can be obtained from skin biopsies. And so it kind of, you know, at least goes around some of the ethical concerns that stem cells typically have. So they're, you know, taken from consenting patients from skin biopsies, and then they are reverted back to a stem cell-like state that then can be made into different organ and cell types. And now there are many groups that are working to try and differentiate these induced stem cells into different um, cells of different organs. And so we can take those and put them in these organs on chips. And B, um, the, the, the second place where organ on chips uh, or the field is going is, I would say, in the combination of different organs, you know, putting them together. And so this would be combining the lung or a nasal chip with a heart chip, combining the heart with the gut or the liver, putting all these things together and seeing if you can create, you know, essentially an overall sort of a human organ system on a chip and to try and interact those things together. And so towards that end, you know, some of the things that we hope to, to do in the future is maybe combine one or more of our organ systems together, you know, mainly the nasal airway lung with the heart, for example, and to see if we can create a model of, you know, a breathing human oxygenating the blood, you know, and back and forth and, you know, try to see if we can look at diseases that affect those overall mechanisms. So, like, examining increasingly complex relationships exactly, in the body. Exactly, between these um, you know, different organs and tissues in the body. Kartik Balachandra, thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. This was great. Short Talks from the Hill is now available wherever you get your podcasts. For more information and additional podcasts, visit arkansasresearch.uark.edu, the home of research and economic development news at the University of Arkansas. Music for Short Talks from the Hill was written and performed by local musician Ben Harris.